Well, as they say, what goes up must come down, and history shows us that our property markets move through a cycle of a downturn, a stabilisation phase, an upturn, a boom stage, and then rinse and repeat. Now that we're in the downturn stage of the property cycle, I want to spend today's show explaining some lessons I've learned from the past property cycles. So I'm going to discuss a bit about what you should do when the markets go a little bit crazy. And crazy could mean going down in areas where you didn't expect them to, or up in areas at other times. I'll show you what I learned from the past. I'm also going to explain to you how you can either make or lose a fortune in 2019 in property by doing the right things or the wrong things. And in my mindset moment, I'm going to explain to you the importance of acting in spite of your fears. Lots to cover today, so welcome once again to the Michael Yardney Podcast. Welcome to the Michael Yardney Podcast, where each week you will learn a number of new ideas regarding success, property investment, and money in around 30 minutes. Our show is brought to you by Metropole, who specialize in helping you grow, protect, and pass on your wealth through strategic property advice. Now, here's your host, Michael Yardney, Australia's most trusted property commentator, who has once again been voted our leading expert in wealth creation. That's the fifth time he's won a similar award in the last seven years. As I explained in the introduction today, I want to share with you some of the lessons that I've learned having invested pretty successfully, I must say, for over 40 years and having worked my way through quite a few property cycles. I've sort of lost track, but it's probably about eight. And I've learned that the market moves through cycles, through a downturn stage, then it moves into a stabilisation phase, the market turns up and then there's the boom, and then rinse and repeat. Australia's property markets have now clearly turned into the downturn phase. Now, of course, there's multiple sub-markets, so not all markets are in the downturn phase, but overall, they're being dragged down by the two big capital cities. But let's be clear, I'm expecting a soft landing. There's no crash ahead. So what I want to explain to you today is how to take advantage of these times from the lessons I've learned from previous downturns. I've learned things like booms don't last forever. Whether it's property, whether it's shares, whether it's Bitcoin, booms don't last forever. The thing is, booms are just one part of the cycle. So they're always going to end at some point. And we wanted the last boom, the one in Sydney and Melbourne in particular, to end because Growth was unsustainable at that sort of rate, double-digit growth, when wages weren't going up much, when inflation wasn't going up much. That sort of growth would have led to a bubble, which would have led to a crash. At the moment, there's no forced sales. It's actually a credit crunch that last year started to slow our markets down. But remember, every boom sets us up for the next downturn, just as every flat period provides opportunities to get set for the next upturn. So the trick is for you to be prepared for the downturn when it comes and be ready to make the most of the current softer market conditions we've got now to prepare for the upturn, as it will eventually certainly come. Another lesson I've learned over the years is you've got to stick to your long-term strategy. Don't change your long-term strategy because of short-term factors. Look for what's always worked rather than what's working now. Long-term wealth is going to be created in property through capital growth, the, the growth of the value of your properties. When you retire, the majority of what you're going to own isn't going to be the cash you've got, the rent you've got, the tax you've saved, the money you've earned. It's going to be the untaxed capital growth of your property. Now, sure, cash flow is important. It's going to keep you in the game. But it's the capital growth of your property portfolio that's going to get you out of the rat race. But it's a slow capital growth that occurs. And over time, eventually, compounding and leverage will increase your asset base. So successful property investors know it takes time to become financially independent. Be wary of this new breed of spruikers out there trying to lure the uneducated investors into parting with their money by offering them a short-term cut to riches. It doesn't work. During a market downturn, fear starts to rear its head. People start making poor investment decisions, particularly those who bought near the market peak. Let's face it, emotions of any kind aren't good when you're investing. The secret is to keep your eye on the long-term horizon and not to worry so much about the vagarities of the market because they will always pass. No, it's easy to say. It's not easy to do. And this year, just like every year, 
Finance is going to be important because we know it. Property investment really is a game of finance with some houses thrown in the middle. Strategic investors don't only buy real estate, they buy themselves time by having the right financial structures in place, including cash flow buffers, to ride through this stage of the property cycle. One more lesson I'd like to share with you before we get into the meat of the show is that it's important to invest in locations with a future not with the past. The bulk of your property's performance is going to be determined by the location. Rather than looking for somewhere that's cheap now because of where we are in the cycle, find a location where local economic growth is going to lead to jobs growth. That's going to lead to wages growth. It's going to lead to population growth. Look for a suburb where the local demographic can afford to and is going to be prepared to pay for the sort of properties that they want to buy that they can afford to buy because they earn a high disposable income. So they're the sort of suburbs that are going to outperform in the medium to long term. Sure, in the short term, some suburbs won't do as well. You've got to keep that long-term perspective. Now, I'd like to get on with the first part of the show, which I've called how to cope with crazy markets, how to do well in the current property market. So let's get on with the show. And then there's two other great segments I want to share with you as well. I've been investing for over 40 years now, and I don't know, through probably eight property cycles, and I believe that gives me a different perspective on our property markets, and that's what I'd like to share with you today. Now, I recently read an article by Morgan Housel on the Collaborative Fund blog, and while he tends to write about the behavioural psychology related to the stock market, much the same applies to property. So I'd like to give credit to some of the concepts I'm going to discuss with you today to Morgan Housel. You see, every time I read his blogs, I realise that while I've spent years trying to learn new stuff, when I look back, I end up realising that just a few big ideas changed how I think about investing and it drives what I most believe about investing. Now, I've said it before, But it's important to remember that our property markets are controlled by homeowners who occupy around 70% of all the properties in Australia. But booms, property booms are created by investors and by investor sentiment, pushing property values above what their intrinsic value is. Now, in the last couple of years, we've experienced challenging times and we're going to continue those this year. And in those times, the value of many properties around Australia is dropping. However, when I look back with perspective, I now recognise that every past decline in property values, every property downturn, was a great opportunity to set yourself up for the next property market upturn. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? Past downturns look like an opportunity, while every future property slump looks like a risk. As I look back at what I've learned about the property markets, I come to realise that the one of the biggest factors affecting property markets in the short term is consumer sentiment. You know, changes in investor mood. And moods don't care about the fundamentals. They don't care about spreadsheets. They don't care about reasoning. And they make fools of us who try to predict them. I found that property markets move fast, yet people's expectations of returns are more sticky. Now, that holds true in both directions. So gains shouldn't feel so good as they do when the property market's booming, and declines shouldn't hurt as much as they do if you take a long-term horizon over a number of years. And property investment really should be at least a 5- to 10-year horizon, if not hold forever. Having said that, while many investors are disappointed, they're upset about the current falling property values, particularly values in Melbourne and Sydney, it was only a couple of years ago that the more experienced property investors and commentators were hoping that the market would slow down, like it is now. And the reason I was hoping it would was to prevent the much bigger drop we would have had, the property bubble bursting that we would have had if market values in Sydney and Melbourne kept going up at double-digit growth. So a lesson I've learned is that market downturns are inevitable. They're just the way the market works. The property market goes in cycles. Now, there are two ways to prepare for the property market downturns. You can expect them to come, or you can predict when they're going to come. The former is realising that throughout your investment career, 
things will occasionally go crazy. The latter is trying to predict things that are going to go crazy at a specific time. You know, like people are saying the property bubble is going to burst next year or a recession is going to happen in 2021. The former, knowing that it's going to happen, isn't hard and it helps, while the latter, trying to predict the time, is extremely difficult and it backfires on those who try. I've also come to recognise that our property markets tend to be pushed to crazy extremes once in a while. But looking back, it's never as crazy as it seemed at the time. It's the result of a number of innocent things playing out. I've realised that different groups of investors have different time horizons. Some have a short-term focus, and you know, they're looking for the quick profits like the next hotspot or the next fad. Others, at the other extreme, are generational buy-and-hold property investors. And then there's a whole group of investors in between. Now, each group tries to exploit profit opportunities within their own time frame. So short-term investors, they're chasing the quick buck, even though that's really hard to do in residential real estate. I know that's not what some property so-called property experts, this new generation of people are telling you they're going to try and sell you these courses and uh, things that are going to say you can make short-term profits. So what I guess I'm saying is short-term investors are chasing the quick buck. Sometimes the momentum created by these short-term speculators and sometimes the profits that they make are strong enough to capture the attention of investors with longer time horizons. And their strategies normally uh, are based on, rely on, basic fundamentals. But that's when things go crazy, when the action of long-term investors playing one game becomes influenced by the action of short-term investors who are playing a different game and appear to know something that long-term investors don't. And that's why we get property booms when suddenly rational people behave irrationally. Well, I guess you've learned by now that most of us aren't irrational when it comes to money. Because money finances brings out the gullible side of people because the stakes are high and it's hard to measure the odds of specific outcomes. So what I found is that otherwise smart people hang on to the words of some of these wild forecasts just in case. Look, maybe Hobart is going to be the next place to go. Maybe I really should go to the Gold Coast because they're building all those high-rise towers. You know, they look for the next hotspot, they buy off the plan, thinking their property is going to go up in value before they settle. And that's what creates these downturns. So, putting it all together, there are three legal investment strategies. You can be smarter than other people, you can be luckier than other people, or you can be more patient than others. So, you should know your edge. I don't know you. I don't know which of those three you are, but know what your expertise is and how hard it is to maintain it. You see, if investing was all about maths, mathematicians would be rich. If it was all about history, historians would be rich. If it was all about economics, economics, I can't even say it, economists would be rich. If it was all about the psychology of uh, um, success and psychology of money, psychologists would be rich. In reality, becoming wealthy through property, becoming a good investor is a mix of many disciplines. But some of the Brightest people I've come across specialise in one topic and can't see the world through the lens of others, and that's why their predictions fail. You see, there's two types of information about investing. Stuff that you're still going to care about in the future, and stuff that matters less and less over time. In other words, long-term versus expiring knowledge. There's so much information these days, it's vital to align what you read with how relevant that reading is going to remain over time. That's one of the problems we're experiencing at the moment in the last couple of years when the media is creating almost a self-fulfilling prophecy because it's creating a crisis of consumer confidence. Weekly auction results are interesting, but their relevance declines over time and expires with a long enough time horizon. It's the same with economic news, it's the same with market news, and it's the same with many commentators' forecasts. Asking whether these are important misses the bigger question of how long will this remain important given my strategies and given my time horizon. That's why I'm careful about what I read and whose commentary I listen to. I follow people who've been around for a long time. 
I follow people who've developed a level of perspective because they've worked through cycles. I look for timeless principles. I look for what has always worked rather than what works now. That's what we're coming across at Metropole a lot at the moment. People say, well, the market's changed. What's different? What should I do now? You should do what's always worked, not just what worked now. And the only way to know the kind of news that's relevant to you is to Get a deep understanding of the principles that will have the biggest impact on your strategy over the longest period of time. And that's why I appreciate you giving me your time and why I'm trying to give you this big picture principle rather than exactly what's going to happen in the short term because your lifetime results as an investor will be mostly determined by what you do during challenging times, crazy times, wild times like these. We're coming up for our break, but stick around because in a moment I'm going to be back with two important sessions. My mindset moment, and you know I love preparing those for you, and I'm going to explain to you the importance of acting in spite of your fears. Because at the moment, people are a bit nervous, people are a bit scared. I'll tell you how to do that. And then we're going to discuss why some people are going to gain a fortune, make a fortune in this current stage of the property cycle, and others are going to lose a fortune. I know which side I want to be on. I know which side I'm going to be on. Let's see what side you're going to be on when we come back after this short break. If you're unsure what to do next in our changing property markets, why not turn to the proven and trusted team at Metropole Property Strategists to take advantage of their expertise of profitably investing through the last five property cycles? The team at Metropole have been involved in over $3 billion worth of property transactions, creating wealth for their clients, and they can do the same for you. They don't sell property, so their advice is independent and unbiased. Metropole can devise a strategy, their buyer's agents will buy your property for you, or you could use their renovations team, property development, or portfolio management services. Arrange a time for an obligation-free chat at metropole.com.au. Now here's Michael's mindset message. Remember, a change in your thinking will lead to a change in your life. I'd like to share some interesting facts with you. Did you know the first car was invented in Germany in 1886 when there were no proper roads, no petrol stations, and in fact it was against the law? But Karl Benz launched it anyway. Did you know amongst the 50 greatest pieces of music ever created, six belonged to Mozart, five to Beethoven and three to Bach? But in order to create those, Mozart apparently wrote over 600 songs, Beethoven over 650 and Bach well over a 1,000. I also read that Thomas Edison had around 2,000 patents, yet only a handful would be recognised. And Albert Einstein published 248 scientific articles, yet only a few of them got recognised for his theory of relativity. I guess it shows that you don't always win, but every time you lose, you get stronger. The issue is that most people are scared to even try. They're waiting for the perfect moment, I don't know, to buy the next investment property or take that business opportunity or start a new relationship. I mean, no one likes approaching the bank for money and stepping outside their comfort zone uh, if they want to start a business. Uh, no one likes the rejection. No one wants the door slammed in their face. They don't want to see their efforts fall short. I know, rejection is painful. But nothing is as painful as being stuck where you don't belong. If you want to get to the next level, Start before you're ready. That's one of the messages I want to share with you today. Because no one's going to do it for you. Your fear of looking stupid is in fact making you look stupid. Because the only thing worse than inaction is seeing somebody dumber than you, less skilled than you, doing better than you. Look, let's be realistic. To get ahead in this world, in the real world, you're going to have to take action. So so why is it that most people don't take action. Now, sometimes it's lack of knowledge, but more frequently it comes down to fear that's stopping them. It's stopping people living their dreams. However, I've found that successful people tend to act in spite of their fears. They've learned to harness their fears and use them to their advantage. You'll often hear me say, your thoughts lead to your feelings, 
Your feelings lead to your actions, and your actions lead to your results. It's something I learned many, many years ago when reading the book The Science of Getting Rich by Wallace Wattles. And T. Harv Eckers has renewed those thoughts in his great book, Secrets of the Millionaire Mind. Look, your thoughts lead to your feelings, your feelings lead to your actions, your actions lead to your results. And the fact is, look, we all got lots of good ideas, we've got sufficient thoughts, we've got sufficient feelings, but the problem is most people don't take action. As I was suggesting a moment ago, the culprit for most people is fear. And that's why to succeed in life, you've got to take action despite your fears. Now, some of the common fears I hear about when I mentor people in my 12-month Learn the Science of Becoming Wealthy mentorship program include, well, the common one, property, I guess, is the fear of debt. People are scared to take on debt. They don't understand how to uh, manage their money properly. Of course, another one is the fear of ridicule. Look, you can't do much about what other people say, but you can control how you react to it. What other people think about you is really none of your business. Of course, a big one is the fear of failure. People are scared that what if I make an attempt at whatever and it doesn't work. I understand why people don't like that. No one likes to get it wrong. Interestingly, another fear a lot of people have is the fear of success. Surprisingly, this can be almost as paralyzing as the fear of failure. And it sort of comes back to something called the imposter syndrome or the fear of not being worthy. Many people fail to take action because they fear they don't deserve success or wealth. And this tends to stem from their financial programming that they received as children. And interestingly, these fears, even the fear of not being worthy, I see this amongst successful people as well as less successful people. So the key to success is not to let your fears scare you into inaction, but to use them to prepare you for action. In other words, you need courage. And if you think about it, you can only experience courage in the face of fear. Yet fear is our greatest obstacle to living happy, peaceful, powerful lives. So what what is fear? I guess the true definition of fear is anticipation of pain. Since anticipation is based in the future, and the future only really exists in our imagination, fear doesn't really exist in reality. It only lives in our head. Therefore, it's our protective mind that prevents us from taking actions necessary to attain our dreams. You know, your, your mind's there to look after you, to protect you. It's like an overworried mother and it's constantly creating doom and gloom scenarios trying to scare the heck out of you in the hope that you won't try anything new. Your mind doesn't like change, does it? And your predictive mind's favourite word is, what if What if this happens? What if that happens? And even though none of these things have actually happened, and when you think about it, the chances of these things ever happening is unlikely But this soap opera script continues to blare loudly in our head. Have you noticed most of the things you worry about never actually occur? But unfortunately, we tend to take this mind trick as gospel and we have all these wonderful ideas of growth and opportunity, but we get bogged down by the uncertainty and the doubt. So it's important to recognize that our protective mind's not necessarily right. It's not necessary to believe it. Its agenda has nothing to do with making us happy or successful. Its job is to keep you in a place that's safe and secure and familiar. Unfortunately, many people just wait for their fears to subside before taking action. Now, that's a big mistake. It's not necessary to get rid of your fears in order to act. The most effective strategy is to learn to tame your fears by acknowledging the feelings and then taking action anyway. Fear itself has really got no power over you. It's you, you alone, that can give fear its power. If you allow fear to stop you, it will. If you recognise that it's really just a protective part of your brain doing its job, sometimes a little too well, you can simply say to your mind, thank you for sharing. And then you just proceed with your actions. Now, just to make things clear, as I said a moment ago, successful people also have fears. Successful people have doubts. Successful people worry. Once a year, I get together with a small group of very successful business people, entrepreneurs and investors at Wealth Retreat. 
And as we unpack what's going on, what's allowed them to get to where they've gotten to and what's holding them back from getting to the next level, it's interesting how they all share the same fears, the same imposter syndrome, the same feelings of not being worthy, not being good enough. The only difference, though, between those who've succeeded and those who don't is that the successful people have acted in spite of their fears. They've acted in spite of their doubts. They've acted in spite of their worry. If they can, so can you. So ask yourself, what would I do if I absolutely knew I couldn't fail? That's a really good question. What would I do if I absolutely knew I couldn't fail? Because the answer to that is likely to give you a good indication of what you would do and who you would become if you lived your life based on what's in your heart, what's in your soul, what's in your desire, as opposed to what you fear. And what this means is that every time you're feeling uncomfortable, instead of retreating back into your comfort zone, pat yourself on the back and say, hey, 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 this is great. I'm moving forward. I'm growing. Because when you become uncomfortable, that's what's happening. If you want to become a successful, whatever it is, property investor, business person, entrepreneur, if you want to truly become one of the wealthy, you're going to have to become comfortable with being uncomfortable. Are you poised to make a fortune in property this year? Or are you going to lose a fortune? Ooh, wouldn't that be nice to know? You know what they say, what goes up comes down. And there's no doubt that segments of our property market are now in the slum phase of the cycle. And that's going to catch out some naive investors who hope the values of their properties would just keep rising forever. This means those who went in with the wrong understanding are probably going to lose money in the next little while in our property downturn. But now hear me out. I'm not one of those doomsayers saying our property markets are going to collapse. You've heard me in the podcast before. You've listened to me. You've seen my blogs. And you know I firmly believe the outlook for Australia's property market remains strong. And when prices rebound and the value of well-located properties, investment-grade properties and good homes reach new peaks, people are going to look back and say, what was all that fuss about in 2018, 19, when the property markets went down a bit? And that's because Australia's real estate markets are supported by two major fundamentals, our strong population growth, which ensures that consistent demand is going to occur for housing in certain locations. You're going to have to know where they are. But the other thing is the wealth of our nation, because just having demand without the ability to be able to afford properties would be an issue. But the wealth of our nation means that the majority of Australians can afford to buy a property. But between now and the next upturn phase of the cycle, that's probably going to come a bit sooner than you think, there is going to be a painful learning curve for some property investors. Particularly for those who got carried away with the boom, often fearing they're going to miss out, and those who took on maximum debt, and they didn't really understand how the property cycle worked. Now, of course, You could be the exception. In every property downturn, some strategic investors do really well. I know I kept investing during the property slumps of the early 1980s, and that was when I first was reasonably new, still probably 10 years into property, and I didn't know any better. At that time, there was limited information available. There weren't all the property statistics. The internet wasn't around. And when you eventually did find out what was going on with property, it was a year or two later. Too late to know then, so it was long after the fact. However, in the downturn of the early 90s, and then during the global financial crisis of 2008 to 2010, and in the slump of 2011-12, interestingly, my property portfolio performed well because I followed a few simple rules that helped me come out on top no matter what the markets were doing. So I'd like to share some advice with you, things that got me through those difficult times that I hope are going to help you get through this year, which will be a little bit like last year, some areas are going to do well, some areas are going to slump a little bit more before the market picks up. So the first lesson for you is become financially fluent. Learn everything you can about how money, finance and property works. And then when you're ready, start investing. Don't try and time the market. I think you can speed up your learning by getting a trusted mentor and a team. That's going to help you immensely. 
but you still need a solid understanding of how things work to make sound decisions. Otherwise, you'll be easy prey for those property spruikers who are out there. The second lesson I'd like you to learn to get through these more difficult times this year are to adhere to a proven investment strategy. If you follow a time-tested strategy and not speculate, you're going to be ahead. The problem is most investors find my strategy for successful investing too simple. They find it boring. They're looking for something exciting. They're looking for something more complicated. They're looking for the next hotspot. In my mind, your property investing should be boring so that the rest of your life is exciting so that you can relax about your investments rather than worry about them. The next tip sounds so sensible, so basic, I shouldn't have to say it. But the answer is I must only buy investment-grade properties. You see, in the current market, there are fewer properties on the market for sale but even a smaller percentage of them are what I'd be calling investment grade. I think less than 5% of properties on the market are what I would call investment grade or where I'd be investing. Those sort of properties are going to deliver stable, wealth-producing rates of return in the long term. Sure, there's plenty of investment stock, you know, what they... Don't confuse the two. That, That investment stock is what is built by marketers, by developers to sell to investors. They're sold by those off the plan marketers, by the estate agents, by the property marketers to naive investors. But those sort of properties lack scarcity. They don't have appeal to owner occupiers, to homeowners, and in general, they're sold at a premium. And there's no ability for you to add value. So it doesn't fit any of the criteria you've heard me talk about before. That's not investment grade. On the other hand, investment grade properties are in the right location. They appeal to a wide range of owner occupiers, But affluent owner-occupiers, they have street appeal, they have favourable aspect, and they have an element of scarcity to them. And as you know, I also like properties to which I can add value. Another lesson for this year is invest for the long term. Real estate's a long-term game. It's not a way to make money fast. And the other thing is growth isn't linear. There are going to be years when property values flatten for a while. There'll be a couple of years every cycle when properties fall. And then property values will rise again. If you've got a well-located property in one of our capital cities in a good location, the market will, over the long term, do the heavy lifting, but you've got to get the right property in the right location. So you've got to ensure that you've got sufficient financial buffers so you won't be forced to sell when the market turns against you, if it does. Now, I don't see the market turning against anyone who's got good properties in a significant way. The Melbourne and Sydney markets may drop another 5% this year before they eventually flatten out and then turn around. The Brisbane market's probably going to continue to do well this year, as will the Canberra market. And I wouldn't even be looking at the other sort of markets at the moment. Now, of course, I talked a moment ago about following a system, following a strategy. So please, even though you've heard me say it before, indulge me. Let me remind you what my six stranded strategic approaches to buying a good property. First of all, as I said, you only buy properties that appeal to owner-occupiers because they buy with their hearts, not like investors who buy with their calculators, and they're willing to pay more for a home and consequently push up surrounding property values. Now, I'm not saying you sell your home, but I want the sort of home that's going to appeal to owner-occupiers because they're the ones that are buying now during the flatter times as well as during the good times. A large percentage of owner-occupiers in the location that you're buying underpins the property market. You also buy below intrinsic value. That's why we avoid new and off-the-plan properties which come at a premium. Of course, it's important to buy properties which have got a high land-to-asset ratio. That's where the land component makes up a significant part of the asset base. And you've heard me say before, location does the bulk of the heavy lifting. So you've got to buy in an area that's got a long, strong history of capital growth, but that's going to continue to outperform the averages because there are multiple drivers of capital growth in that area. And also the right demographic people who are living there, who are going to be able to afford to pay a premium to live there because they've got higher disposable incomes. Now, it's not a judge of people, but currently where wages growth is low and where young families and blue collar workers are not getting much wage increase, it's really hard to see people in that area being able to afford more for homes in the next little while and so they can't push up the value of homes so we've got to look at location and the demographics of that location then when you found the right location you look for a property with a twist something a bit unique something a bit special something scarce about it and 
as I said a minute ago, I love properties to which I can manufacture capital growth through renovations, through development. That's what I've been doing for years on purpose because I'm not then waiting for the market to do the heavy lifting. Another tip I'd like to share with you to get you through this year is focus on value, not bargains. Bargains rarely have potential. If no one else wants to buy the property today, no one else is probably going to be wanting to buy it in five years' time. I'm not sure who said it, but I like the quote, price is what you pay, value is what you get. So buy the best property you can afford, the type of property you'd be happy to own for 10 to 15 years' time. And when you look back, you'll say, hey, I bought it in the slump of 2019 when everyone else was sitting on the sidelines waiting for the market to turn. And the other way to help you get through these more difficult times is surround yourself with other successful investors. It's said that you are the average of the five people who you hang around with the most. So surround yourself with high-performing, successful people and soak up their behaviours, their habits and their mindset. You also gain access to their experience, their knowledge and resources. That's going to help you make better investment decisions, better financial choices. Now, if you're not sure who to hang around with, why not join my mentorship program? Go to michaeliardney.com michaeliardney.com, and you're going to find out a lot about how over a decade I've helped over 2,500 people through my one-on-one mentorship program. I'd love to help you this year as well. Sure, a downturn can be a scary time, but there are things you can do to ensure that no matter what happens, you're going to pull yourself through better than most, and I hope I've given you some tips to do that. As we're rounding off this week's show, I'd like to read to you two reviews, as I always do. I love getting the reviews and I get lots of five-star reviews every week. Thank you so much. I enjoy them because it shows that I'm helping you. My intention is to help as many people as I can stop making the mistakes or not even getting into the mistakes that the average property investor makes because I believe we all deserve to have a life of financial freedom and in Australia and the audiences where this podcast listen to all around the world and get reviews from all around the world. I believe that there is the ability to move up, step up, become financially free if you know how. That's what I'm trying to help you do. And if you're getting some benefit from this, please pass the message on to a couple of people. You'd do me such a favour by passing it on to a few people through Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, whichever way you'd like to, or sharing it on any other social media, or in particular, leaving a review. And when you leave a review, if I read it out on the show, as I do every week, I'm going to gift you one of my books. All you've got to do is email me, michael at metropole.com.au, and I'd love to gift you one of my books if I read out your review, like I'm doing for Jason Edwards now, who said, now he left this last year, but I can't get through them all in time. He said, great podcast, Michael. I've followed and listened to you for years on a number of different podcasts and always switch on a little bit more when you speak. Regards, Jason. Well, thank you for the kind words. And then a really long review was left by Matt Leash. uh, And again, this was last year, so... Excuse me if I cut it a bit short, Matt, because you wrote a lot of very nice words. But he says, thanks, Michael, for the information you share. I like the fact that you don't act like you're smarter than the average person, which you probably are anyway, and that you don't promise the moon. Your podcast has been enlightening. And he goes on and explains lots of things that he did learn about it. But he says, I also really like your talk on bias and why we make poor choices. Being a scientist, I really appreciate the fact that you relate on a science somehow to explain most of the biases. Um, anyway, he went on to say, I'll definitely get in touch with you, your team, when I better my savings. Cheers. Well, you left lots of clever words there, Matt. I didn't read them all out, haven't got time. But I wanted to say thank you for taking so much time to leave that very detailed review. And I look forward to helping more people next week through my regular weekly Michael Yardney podcast. Speak to you then. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the Michael Yardney podcast, which was brought to you by Metropole, who help their clients grow, protect and pass on their wealth through strategic property advice. If you got value from today's show, we'd really appreciate it if you would leave a review and we'll read it out on a future show and Michael will gift you one of his books as a way of saying thank you. Just go to michaelyardneypodcast.com forward slash review and let us know what you think. If you don't already subscribe, head over to iTunes or your favorite Android app. You'll find us there as Michael Yardney Podcast. If you'd like to gain instant access to the show notes, head across to michaelyardneypodcast.com. 
Watch out for our show next week. You'll learn some new ideas about property investment, success, and money in around 30 minutes.